Good morning, church. It's really good to bring God's word to us this morning. I've had a, a very interesting week. I've survived the week here at Rosebank. It's really good uh, to, to serve the bride of Christ here. And I really enjoyed it. It was a busy week uh, trying to you know, put together the final prep for this sermon and also just uh, to adjust myself here and understand what's happening at Rosebank. So thank you. I'm really glad that you've called me to serve you. I'm very thrilled uh, to, uh, to serve you um, in this role. Today, truth is in trouble. Imagine if you, you're about to fly somewhere, maybe you go to Oratambo or Lancera Airport, and you, just as you <clears throat> get on the plane, you sit down, and before takeoff, you know, uh, the pilot makes this announcement. And you know these pilots, have, they've got this good voice. You know, I don't know how they do it, I wish I could. Uh, but they make this announcement, and it says, ladies and gents, uh, just before we fly out, I just need somebody who can help me with this flashing red button in front of me. <laughs> I'm not too sure what it's all about. One, you'll be thankful that he told you that he doesn't know what's happening, and also that you're still on ground. You wouldn't want to be told that while you're flying or just before you land. You'd really panic. So you'd be thankful that he would tell you that. Also, just imagine this if you woke up and your face had swelled up, maybe from an infection of some sort, and you go to the GP, and the GP looks at you, and he just sizes you up and says, ah, I think you need Panado. You know, um, look, you'd want somebody who can uh, do a proper diagnosis of what's wrong with you, right? At the core of it, we don't want people that are second-guessing when it comes to our well-being. We want people that know what they're doing. We want the authenticity and we want truth at the COVID. Do you, do you guys agree with me? That is what we want. And I, I, I know that and the sad reality is that truth is in trouble today. We live in an age of relativism where your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. There's a rejection of what truth is. There's a rejection of what absolute truth is. And particularly, what truth, as truth is ascribed in the Bible, there's a rejection to that. The church has been branded as anti-loving or as anti-truthful for many generations. And this generation particularly is wrestling with the whole idea of relativism. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. But we know that objective truth or absolute truth, it stands outside of us. It remains truthful whether we agree with it or not. And it challenges us. It doesn't tell us the things that we want to hear sometimes. It tells us the things that we need to hear. And that is what truth does. So truth stands independently from us. It is objective. And I believe that is why the Apostle John wrote this often forgotten postcard. So we've been on a series on God's forgotten, forgotten postcards, and this is one of them. I have to admit that I've never really read this or studied it before I had to prepare for this preach. I really think that the Apostle John really wanted to get to the bottom of truth. And we see this if you turn with me to page 233 on your Bibles in the New Testament, uh, you'll get to 2 John. It's easy to miss it. It's just one page. It's about 13 verses long. Um, and this is, this is how I know that he wants to address the subject of truth. This is what he says. The elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth, which lives in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in truth. So a good Bible student 
will know that when, when, when an author repeats phrases or certain words a couple of times, that is the emphasis that he wants to make. So John, you could see he was burdened by truth because of the repetition that we find here. It is clear that there was something that had gone wrong about truth. And we're going to find out as we go through this, this passage. And I've broken this passage into four parts. And it's typical, typical style of writing in those days. You had a greeting, which is going to be one of the parts that we look at, the greeting and the points within it. And then you had the main message, the message that he's really addressing. So he, we're going to see John's joy, his reason for being exceedingly joyful. We're going to see that. And yet we're also we're going to see on the third point, his concern, his concern for the, for the people he's writing to. And then finally, we're going to have some final greetings. And that was the, the style of writing in those days. So let's go into the, the first part. So the greetings <clears throat> has some historical background. Well, the, the historical background is in here, but I'm going to bring it to you so that we could better appreciate what God's Word says. I got um, extremely helped by John Stott um, in, in his commentary. And this is, this is, this is going to be helpful for us as we try to understand what is happening over here. What is happening? So I'm going to hit the points and then I'm going to keep on referring back to the passage. So please stay there. Don't close it, okay? We're going to keep on referring to it. I want you to test if it's truthful. Don't take my word for it. All right? That's what I want. <clears throat> so the historical background, he says that um, in the time, the issue that he wants to really, that, that this apostle John wants to deal with is the issue of, of uh, hospitality, of traveling Christians that uh, needed um, lodging, that needed to be accommodated. And the reason for that, the gospel had spread. And because of the, you know, the road infrastructure, it was easy for people to travel to travel between city to city, from village to village. And we know that during the intertestament period, uh, which is Malachi and Matthew, we know that there was those 400 years that seemed to be silent. There was a lot happening at that time. There was a lot of development happening. Uh, the roads were built. You know, there was infrastructure which allowed for the gospel to move, for people to move, because the gospel moves with people. The gospel is carried by people. And also the, the language of the day was Greek, which was the common language that was used. So which this, all these things, these small details allowed the gospel to move. So missionaries or Christians who were in business were able to move from city to city because of the infrastructure. But the problem was the place to stay. So... To quote John Stott, he says, the comforts of the modern hotel or even the village inn were then unknown. In fact, the job of an innkeeper was dishonorable. The village inns were dirty and they were flea infested. <clears throat> and so it was natural for Christians or for Christian people in those towns to host people that are traveling, to host Christians who were in business to host Christians that were missionaries. So it was a common practice. And we see this practice actually in Acts. We see that Paul and his companions, uh, Luke and Silas, they were hosted by Lydia in this home, in the home of Lydia. And Lydia invites them and says, well, we have believed you come here, she had come to know Christ. And she says, come and stay with me. So it was common practice. But just like anything else, it can get abused. And in those days, this hospitality was abused by these people that masked themselves as Christians, that came around and looking for lodging, and <clears throat> they said, no, I'm a Christian. And so they would come in, and John addresses this in depth, and you'll see this, um, and you'll understand, at least with this background in mind. So there was an abuse of this hospitality and also there was a danger that the church or the believers could sort of perpetuate this message of these people that have masked themselves as Christians. Are you guys still with me? Are you guys with me? Mm -hmm. That's good. 
So that is the backdrop that we need to understand Second John and even Third John, which Brett is going to touch on next week. So in, the, in this, let's go back to the passage. In the passage, we're going to look at the author. So the first thing we are told is the elder. That is the, his, how he's introducing himself. He's the elder. And the word in, implies somebody who has oversight over a particular place. So this is the elder. And John, it is believed that he's the author. John, we know that he was the son of, of Zebedee and he was the brother of James. And if you remember in Luke 5, he was called by Christ to come and follow him. You remember that account? He says, come and follow me. These, he's, he's, he's the apostle that as he writes in the fourth gospel, he says, uh, I am the disciple whom the Lord loved. That's what we know of John. And he's written uh, this, uh, this epistle. He's written Third John. He's written Revelation and also First John. There's a lot of agreement that this was the author of this letter, even though he just used the word elder. That probably was the reference given to him. He's the elder, and he writes in his elderly uh, stage of life. And this was probably around the time 90 to 95 AD. And he's an older man who has oversight over many um, local churches. And he, he writes to them. He puts pen to paper because there's something burning in his heart. There's something that he wants to get across. There's also general agreement on this authorship, on his authorship, because of the language that he uses. If you look at 1 John, the language is similar to what we're going to see in 2 John, even in 3 John, and also where he deals with a lot of doctrine and teaching about Christ, which is the gospel, you see the similar, there's a similar pattern, of there's a similar line of thinking. He deals with similar type of, uh, he deals with a similar type of uh, sort of Doctrine, and he focused a lot on the Christology, which looked at Christ as being um, fully God, fully divine, and yet fully man. So he dealt with that. So, and that's that's consistent. That's also one of the ways we could conclude that he is the author <clears throat> of this particular uh, book or this letter. And the recipient, we are told that it is to the lady chosen by God. I don't know what your translation says. Some translation says the elect lady. Um, so who is this lady? There seems to be different schools of thought around this. Was it a particular lady who had children and she was running or she had a church? Typically then they had house churches. So they had these home cells and so it was common for people to have church at home. So was, was John writing to this letter, to this chosen lady? Was he writing that? I think if you look at verse 5, he says... And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. That will seem a little bit inappropriate if John was writing directly to a lady. And also, the other other side of it is, third John, he directly uses the name, he explicitly uses the name of the person he's writing to. So if he was really addressing a particular person, don't you think he would have used the name? So the other school of thought, which I, I'm more so leaning towards, as you could tell, uh, is that um, he was writing to a particular church and its members. And the church is often referred to as the bride of Christ. So it's often referred to in its feminine side. And so it will be, you know, it will make sense. And along with what I've read in verse 5, I think, you know, what has God commanded and who has he commanded? He has commanded the church. I think this out lean towards that school of thought. But anyways, whatever you hold on to, it does not, I'm not doing relativism, by the way, but whatever you hold on to, it doesn't alter the message. All right? So there's this great debate, and some people debate both ways. I just tend to lean on this one. I think he was writing to a particular church particular local church that wasn't named and also the reason for that was persecution in those days was rife for Christians. So he probably did not name it for, for those reasons. But we know that he's writing to a group of Christians and really I think he was writing to a church and the children here that are referred to this lady and her children are the members of that church. And this is what he says about them. He's, 
he tells us the relationship that he has. He says, to the lady chosen by God and to her children whom I love in truth. And that could mean whom I really love, whom I truly love, and not I only, but also all those that know the truth. So all the believers, he's writing and he's representing them. He says, all those that love the truth, all those that have the truth, love you also. They love you also. There's this common bond between, that is shared between Christians. There's a common bond of love that is shared from people from different backgrounds, different cities. I mean, you go to a different place and you find Christians and it's easy to call them brother or sister because there's this bond that we have as Christians. The second point I want to tackle is John's joy, which was, he says, they were walking in truth and love. Let me just read that section. He says, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. This is love that we walk in truth. This is love that we walk in what God has said, as you have heard from the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. Really, the purpose of this letter emerges now. John expresses his exceeding joy for what he found. He found some of them walking in truth. Maybe it was during a visit that he had made recently, or maybe he had heard from somebody, but he had heard that they were walking in truth. They were following truth. They were abiding in truth, in the truth that they believed. He says, I cannot help I cannot tell you how happy I am to learn that many members of your congregation are living out the truth, exactly as the Father commanded us. As he pleads with those that have remained loyal to the truth to keep God's commands, he throws in a comment. He throws in a command that they need to obey. He says, remember, remember what has been said in the beginning. Walk in love. Walk in love. So walking in truth the byproduct of that is to walk in love. It's the love that is shared amongst believers. It is love that is expressed because we have been bound, we bonded together by something. And I want to unpack a little bit what truth is and what truth at least I want us to, to believe. We can see that walking in truth results in living in obedience to God's command. So what is truth? So the word... Scripture gives the best commentary of itself. It says, you know, in other places where the word truth is used, it says truth is the gospel. The gospel is truth. God is truth. In fact, God is the essence of truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So to walk in truth, it is to believe in God. In John 15, which is one of my favorite passages, we learn that Christ calls <clears throat> the branches to remain in the vine, to abide, to commune in the vine. So truth here refers, and primarily as John deals with this, he's looking at their inner lives. He's saying, I found them to be walking in truth. I found them to be believing in God. I found them believing what God says about life. What God says about humanity, I found this to be true. So that is what I want to present, that truth is primarily believing God. It is, it's not necessarily the things that we do of God, but it's being with God. Do you guys get that? Being with God, communing with God. And that is what John found. He found some of them communing with God, growing now, I want us to just apply this section into our lives and just maybe bridge the gap and bring it to the 21st century. And I want to ask this and apply it by using questions, rather. Who do you tend to for truth nowadays? Where do you turn for truth? Where do you turn when you have questions about life? Where do you turn when you have questions about your purpose of life, maybe even marriage, what marriage is? Maybe it's about the use of your money. Where do you tend to for that type of truth? 
Remember, we're living in an age where the idea of truth has been outsourced to just your truth being your truth and my truth being mine. So is there an absolute standard of truth that you tend to? We know that we live in an age of, um, of information. There's a lot of information that flows in us daily. Now, when those things are flooding you from the time you wake up, really, till you go to bed, that flow of information, is that where you tend to for truth? Is that where you find truth? Are you turning to society for truth, or are you turning to God's word for truth? That is something that I've, I'm hoping that as, as this week begins, you'll be thinking about really where do I tend to for truth? I had an interesting conversation yesterday uh, with uh, family members. <clears throat> it was actually my cousin, two cousins of mine, and we're talking about the idea of marriage. <clears throat> and they start this conversation, and he says, of, her, of his sister, he says, you know, when, when, when our sister gets married, I think, you know, she, she needs to write a contract, a contract of marriage. The husband, in that contract, there must be clauses that say the husband must have his own home and she must have a home and then they will build or buy another home where they could just meet each other. And he was dead serious about that. And I asked him, hey man, where where are you getting that? You know, where does that come from? I like those type of conversations because, you know, it's good to hear what people believe so you can lead them to truth. But we know that the Bible, as it talks about marriage, it talks about the idea of leaving and cleaving, right? You leave your parents, you cleave with your spouse. You become one. But society teaches us something different. Society teaches us something different about sexuality. And I know it's not fashionable to say that, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think there's a problem there. Somebody was telling me this week and said on Facebook, when you're selecting your gender, there's about 70 options that you get. I need to look that up, but that scared me. It really scared me because we know truth. Truth is there too. It's male and female. But that very truth is questioned. So who do you tend to for truth? Who is discipling you? Is society discipling you? Or is God and members of a congregation helping you grow? And really, discipleship at the core of it, it is teaching them what Christ has commanded and walking with them as he did with his disciples. And if you are sitting here and you are wrestling with the question of just what is, what is my life supposed to be? And maybe you have not come to a knowledge of Christ. And you're asking the question, what is life? What is the purpose of life? I'm glad that you're here. You've come to the right place. And I'm hoping that as God, God's word is spoken and as you interact with people, that you get to know the reason for their faith. You get to understand where they draw their way of life. Christian community, the other thing that John raises here in light of living in truth, he says how it's expressed is to walk in love, to walk in love with the community. And he says, I'm not writing you something that's new. I ask that we love one another. As, As believers, let us love one another. So maybe a way to apply this as I'm dealing with these questions Do you have love for one another, Rosebank? You cannot claim to love God and hate your brother or sister. You cannot give off what you don't have. You cannot fake love. You cannot. You cannot give what you don't have. When the gospel sits with us and it rests in us, in our hearts, and we are changed... Something changes. We are given a new identity. We are given a new family. Do you have love for the new family that you have? That's another question I'd really love for you to to wrestle with.
this week. I want to give you a bit of a practical thing here, <clears throat> but that is not the aim of this passage. This passage is not to give you another to-do list. You've got so many of those things already. But this passage is aimed at being something as opposed to doing something. It is being, believing in God. And that results in walking in truth. That is, that, is, that is the aim of it. So even as I give this practical maybe thing that you can do, please understand it with that context. You can't fake things. You cannot fake, you cannot correct your behavior. When you're disciplining your child, you cannot just say, stop what you're doing. That's corrective behavior. But you've got to go after the heart. So I'm really going after the heart because I believe that's where God is going. He's going after our hearts. And so even the practical thing here, it's coming from that place. So my point is, you can't manufacture these things. They've got to come from a deep-seated uh, belief. There is a deep-seated relationship that you have with the Father. But one of the ways is to create a good filter. Well, the practical thing is to create good filters for the influx of information that we get. And you do that by communicating with God. And we do that in prayer, and we do that in Bible reading. So can, you, can I just give you a practical thing this week? In the morning when you wake up, before you go onto your phone and look at News 24 and get depressed by all the things that are happening, before you go onto social media to see what's happening, can you feed yourself truth? Can you commune with God? And I'm saying that in the most loving way. Because truth is in trouble. Can you open up God's word and read, pray? Can that be practiced? Can, can we do that, church? Can we commit to doing that? 20 minutes in a day. As you're going, as you're going, think, meditate on his word. We come to the third point, which shows John's concern here. His concern really because of this false teaching. So he tells them and he reminds them in the previous section to walk in truth and to walk in love because of something. He says, I say this from verse 7, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching is both the Father and the Son. And if anyone comes, and even if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house. Remember the context that we, we, I shared earlier. The context was about hospitality. And he's reminding them to walk in truth, to walk in love because of these false teachers that have gone out, these deceivers. This was concerning John. But also to have a better appreciation of that, it is to go back in history because he writes this from Ephesus. And we know that during that time, the Greek culture or the Hellenistic movement had created and taught these different isms which we still have today, there's relativism, you know, and back then it was, it was an offshoot actually of <clears throat> Gnosticism, and it was Docetism. This, this is the belief that they, they had of, <clears throat> you know, and that's what he addresses. He says, those that come to you and not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, they had a belief, and that belief was Docetism, which said, anything that is spirit, it is good but the flesh is wicked. So they couldn't understand that how can good God take human flesh? And that was the problem they had. And if you really, and really dig into this, they are really challenging the very thing that we base our belief on as Christians. And I want you to turn to page, I think it's page 86 on your Bibles. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's written by John and he gives the truth about what these people were believing. Remember, they are saying Christ did not really come in the flesh. So he takes them. Uh, I want to take us back to the origin of 
of what we know, the teaching about Christ coming in the flesh. So if you turn to John, John 1, uh, I think it's on page 86 or 87. I hope I'm not misleading you there. But it reads as follows. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we get more, it gets, it gets more interesting. We know that the Word now is He. It says He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And then it gets on to talk about the one who came before Christ to witness about him, and that's John the Baptist. And then it carries on and it goes back to the idea that it started with in the beginning was the word. So who is the word? It says here from verse 9, <clears throat> He's the true light that gives light to everyone. He was coming into the world. He was in the world. He came in the world. And the world did not recognize him. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his truth, in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And we are told that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen the glory. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So this is teaching about Christ and we know that Christ came for a specific reason and he was to seek and save the lost. And Paul in 2 Corinthians, he said, God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin. He took human flesh, he took our sinful flesh, and yet he remained without sin in order that the righteous requirement will be met through him. So when these false teachers are coming, they are coming and they are fighting that particular belief, which is very core to the Christian message. So John says you'll know them by the message that they preach. They preach that Christ did not come in the flesh. And these people have gone out into the world. So as you open up your home, be careful. Be careful of them. It gives them this caution in verse 8. It says, watch out that you do not lose what we've worked for. What we've been diligently building and growing in and understanding about the, the faith, watch out that that doesn't get distorted because of their teaching. And then he gives this idea of running ahead and not continuing in the teaching. He says, anyone who runs ahead, anyone, Rosebank, who runs ahead <clears throat> and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God, does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching is both the Father and the Son. And if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house. In other words, do not bring them in to entertain their teaching so as to perpetuate their teaching. Now, what Apostle John is, is not saying is that for us in application, it's not saying that we should stop evangelizing because people believe something different. In fact, it challenges us because people believe something different, we ought to walk in the truth so that we could share the truth. So John is not saying that. He's just saying, don't bring them into your home. Don't bring them into um, a place where they influence and change you. Remember the truth. Remember what we've learned from the beginning. That's the sort of idea that we get. So John is concerned. He's challenging the church to not grow complacent. And it's easy for us to grow complacent, isn't it? We can grow complacent. We've been... Christians for so long, man, we know this. And for some, it's cultural. We've just done it every Sunday. We come out to church. Do not grow complacent. Watch out. <clears throat> there are deceivers that have gone out into the world. And we come to the final 
section here. And the section really is simple. It's similar to how it, it ends in Third John. And I'm not going to get into the applications for the church, particularly because Brett is going to come next week and unpack that, what it looks like for us as a church. But my aim this morning was to challenge us to know the truth. Do you know the truth? Do you know God? The final point, he says, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be made complete. Verse 13, the children of your sister, of your elect sister, which I think is the sister congregation, they greet you. They send their greetings. Even the fact that he would put pen to paper <clears throat> instead of, I mean, it's clear he wanted to see them. He could have just come and seen them. But he wants to send this message ahead to say, hey, guys, it's urgent. You need to prepare yourself. Walk in truth. He's reminding them of truth. And then he warns them of what is happening. He says there are people that are not walking in truth. So we get the, the love that John has for this church this particular congregation that he, loves, that, he, that he loves and he's writing to. And I think just as we close, really just if you walk away with something here today, it's two things. It is to continue walking in truth, if you have the truth already. It is to be a vessel of truth. It is to be people that know the truth so as to speak truth into the lives of people. And that is the goal, that is the mission that Christ has set for his church. And you are his bride. And if you do not know the Lord, I really want to make an appeal to you. That his arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought at that cross. That the cross of Christ coming in human flesh and dying for our sins, which was under attack. That means you can come to him freely. He's got his arms open wide for you that do not know him. Don't leave here without doing business with God. Today as you hear his word, do not harden your heart. Church, create filters for truth. Create strong filters that can be able to see what is truthful or not. We will perish. This beautiful building will become a shopping center if we do not protect this truth and if we do not believe this truth and live this truth out. Church, walk in truth and love. Let me pray for us. We thank you, merciful God and Father, that you have brought us to know you and your Son by your Spirit and your word, and it has caused us, Lord, to, um, to believe because it was proclaimed to us. We thank you, Lord, for those that shared your word with us and, and really pointed us to you, God. And I pray that as a church we'll do that, we'll point others to you, God. And I pray for the believers here, for the church community here, to take heed of what John is challenging us to here, Lord. I pray that, Lord, we may continue um, rooted in you, being built up in you and strengthened by you, Lord. Help us to go to your word. Help us, God, to be people that walk in truth and love. Christ, we implore you, Lord, that we may be people that are kept from hypocrisy, people that are kept from um, flip-flopping and not knowing what truth is. But, Lord, help us to know truth and understand it for ourselves so that, Lord, we may truly be the salt and light in this world. I pray now, Lord, for this church. Pray that you do that. In your son's name I pray. Amen.